Terry, really great to sit down and talk on camera. So just a little bit of background. I understand that you've been involved in the Integral community for many years. You've been thinking deeply about some of the same topics that we've been covering on the channel. And you've also been watching quite a lot of the stuff we've been putting out. And what I really like is that it seems that we're, the conversation has been evolving ever since it started with Jordan Peterson and some of the other thinkers. And it's kind of becoming a little bit more self-aware that, that and I'm, I'm really interested in your background and what you, you're interested in and keen to add to the conversation and where we might go in this, this conversation today. Great. Well, there are a number of things that you've been surfacing recently that are taking us into another territory in your conversations with Daniel Schmachtenberger and Jordan Greenhall and others, you're facing the existential risk very directly. You're also bringing in integral perspectives, but you're staying connected to the psychic depth that was present in your original work with Jordan Peterson. And all of that is beginning to constellate a conversation that's emergent. You're more curious about what you don't know then you are interested to rehash all the implications of what's already been clarified. And that's absolutely essential because the existential risk is more immediate and more crucial than most people are able to countenance. Yeah, and I want to just sort of put a little flag in, in that now because one of the biggest tensions that I can feel in the audience and in, in the, the general culture, and I think it's a big rift within like the intellectual dark web constellation that we've talked a bit about, is this idea of existential risk and where we are at as a society. Because in some ways, we're certainly in one of the best, like things are as, as good as they've been. You've got the Steven Pinkers of this world saying, and look right. at, and they're right, exactly. So how do we hold that complexity of ever increasing um, metrics in many, many different areas, but at the same time, this wide sense that a lot of us have, and especially sort of some of the most, um, the people who've engaged with this the most and some of the most profound thinkers that I've encountered who also have this sense that we're in a self-terminating system through exponential tech that is becoming ever more fragile and the risks are multiplying. How do we hold both of those things? You, you just said that we're right. We are in the best of all worlds in human history at the same time as we have this sort of sense that there's something not right. quite right. And there's something even better than the fact that we're in the best moment in human history. There's the fact that we have access to all the wisdom traditions of mankind at once and we're in conversation. They are in conversation with one another and with the methods of modern science in a self-critical examination that is liberating us to radical and profound wisdom intuitions which wake us up to the fact that if we're really unclouded and awake to any moment it's infinitely deep, profound and beautiful and gratitude and amazement are our best relationship to every reality. So all of that is even better than the fact that things are better than they ever were before. But we have to have the cognitive complexity to walk down the street and chew gum at the same time. And it can be true that we are the luckiest people who've ever lived, that we have access to more information, wisdom, mobility, uh, pleasure, uh, innumerable uh, advantages and that this makes something new possible and that it's a tremendously exciting time to be alive and that we're also alive at a time in which the existential risk, the unsustainability of our current trajectory is becoming obvious in, in many different vectors. Uh, there are all kinds of natural world issues. We have an ecological dilemma that is far wider and more complex than just climate change. But our crisis isn't limited to the ecological dimension. We have crises in culture and society that are undermining our ability to make collective decisions with any degree of wisdom. And those, in some sense, are more fundamental. We also have the arising of an attention economy that's dumbing us down with a race to the bottom of the brainstem in which exponential tech has exceeded human weakness and in which we're reverse engineering our nervous systems to turn us into machines of destructive consumption. And we're none of us able to account for all of these things adequately. We're facing questions and challenges that no analysis is equal to. 
we need to figure much more out about all of this. The attempt to understand better is crucial, and I think that's where we're actually leading. That's our, 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 although we are facing questions for which we don't have adequate answers, we are advancing rapidly in our ability to understand where we are. On the other hand, mere understanding isn't enough. We have to become different. Our very way of being is being asked to shift. Not just our lifestyles, but even our, our not, just in, not even just our values, but there are profound deepenings and shiftings, maturations of our humanity that are alive in the domain of feeling and care. And if we're to actually achieve not, anti-rivalrous dynamics in our social relations. This is a, a, a demand for our spiritual growth, we can say, but it, it's also growth of, say, friendship, gr growth of our ability to cooperate. And we tend not to drop into the, the level of wonder and amazement and presence and, and vulnerability that are appropriate. You know, I'm alive in a time when what happens in my lifetime might very well be determinative as to the future human-friendly or various kinds of animal-friendly conditions on the planet in which the great-grandchildren of human beings and the great-great-great-great of almost every other species, not, not every, but many, many other species, might hang in the balance. And I'm living a middle-class lifestyle that's contributing to many of the destructive vectors that are at play. So it takes a lot of human maturity to be with this moral, you know, what could have more moral force than our impact on the whole future of life? And yet, if we take that seriously, we tend to get contracted and panicked and upset and lose track of the inherent happiness that is the very nature of our sanity. So we're asked to grow. And that being with that request to grow breaks our conceit of knowledge, my, my, my comfort in being smart and figuring things out and being excited about what's next, rest in a place where I'm not quite as self-questioning as is necessary. So there's a kind of vulnerability and the, uh, very rich human dimensions that are really needing to become primary in the conversation now. And yeah, there's this, uh, there's this tension, and we've talked about this before we started filming, of the intellectual understanding and the systems understanding that we need to kind of make sense of the world and also but this sense that that we have as people who've done been very familiar with kind of different kinds of spiritual practice that that's not enough that actually there's another dimension that's needed as well and it's quite a that's a synthesis that I don't see quite coming to fruition yet but I think we're 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 in this this is part of the conversation that i think rebel wisdom is trying to have in particular is what are the different pieces that we need to bring together so i'm interested and you you've also talked about kind of this conversation is becoming a bit more self-aware and it's it certainly seems to have a direction to it what do you think where do you think it's at and where do you think it needs to go well one of the things that I appreciate most about what you've done is that you've continued to be curious and, stay, as I said, you've stayed interest, more interested in what is emerging and what is new than simply re tracking the implications of what's already obvious, which is absolutely crucial because we're, things are moving very, very fast and emergence is the name of the game. I think if you deeply consider all of the data, you come to the conclusion that we are caught in a dynamic that's going to require nonlinear social transformation and that that social transformation is going to depend on profound maturity. It's probably only going to be achievable at first in social experiments, subcultures, places where a whole new set of agreements can be established and reinforced among limited numbers of people so that they can achieve new efficiencies. Can, can, we, can we unpack that nonlinear social? What did you say? Nonlinear social transformation. Transformation. Can we unpack that? Because that's a big well. It's, it's it's essentially uh, if we if we reckon honestly and courageously with intellectual honesty and moral clarity, we have to recognize that all of us are living lives that are right now actively destroying the very life support systems 
that we are dependent on and that the future is dependent on. And we have a moral dilemma in relationship to our great-grandchildren's generations and the future of life on the planet. And that is shocking and difficult. It disarms pretty much everything. All the good work you are doing that might ripple out into posterity, all your family and kids and grandkids, everything you love, everything you value, may no longer be viable. All the things that give our lives meaning may be challenged. This is a hyper-object. It's too big to look at. It's too big to reckon with, even emotionally or spiritually. It's overwhelming. Everyone I know who has actually faced this, not just in an abstract mental way, but in a felt and embodied way, has gone through more than one dark nights of the soul because this is essentially too horrible to contemplate. It's a terrible truth beyond our, our knowing. And it doesn't contradict the wonderful truths that are also simultaneously real. And what it is to be with what tends to contract us and a, a fundamental trust of being, trust of life, that is the essence of sanity, is a, a yoga, you might say, of human maturation that operates not just in the domain of our understanding, but of our feeling and of our embodiment. So I think that the conversation that has been emergent in on rebel wisdom is now cresting to a place where you're able to contend with deeper paradoxes than ever before. And the transformation of the focus from merely the advancement of knowledge and understanding to the actual experiments with new levels of maturity and ways of being, new, new kinds of friendship and cooperation, non-rivalrous dynamics. What, what is it to really create them? And that's not something that we can simply understand abstractly through game theory as brilliantly as uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger is able to articulate those things. Uh, uh, he's a wonderful thought leader. And yet the, the shift in our ways of being and the heart-to-heart -heart conversations that it takes for us to establish a different way of being related to one another, these are the, the edge. And I think that you're going to be going into those places where the conversation isn't just about understanding but about practice where the conversation isn't only about the... Uh, we have to objectify things in order to see them clearly. This is the essence of, De of Robert Keegan's developmental theory. We make subject object. But that objectification of our own way of being can also become a limitation. When we are self-objectified, we are removed from full feeling presence in our own experience. And we're in a challenge now to our feeling, like the pre-trans fallacy in integral theory. There's a kind of way of being embedded in feeling that we need to transcend. We need to get beyond our reactivity and our uh, unconscious feeling natures. But then we have to return to a capacity to feel more deeply, that to, to love, to, to notice, to use our total intelligence, which is centered in the brain in many respects primarily, but there are also centers of intelligence in, that are studied in neurocardiology at the heart and neuroenterology at the gut. The whole sensing organism is needed. And we have hyper-specialized and fragmented to the point that almost all of our conversations are partial. And, and that's okay because that's our context. Of course we're going to come with partial perspectives. But a, a compassionate and curious conversation opens into inquiring beyond those limits. And that epistemic humility and the availability that that opens up, the vulnerability and curiosity to learn from one another, shifts the whole nature of the conversation. A kind of shared inquiry that really our lives depend on in, in many ways has to open up. And all along that way, we're going to have to course correct. Even right now, as I speak with you, I notice uh, I'm excited. I want to get these ideas out. My energy's gone up a little higher in my body. There's a relaxation into this trust of being that wouldn't be a bad thing for me to be reminded of. 
uh, there's a, uh, always little course corrections that every one of us would do well to make in every moment. So if this conversation is to be emergent, I want to be willing to shift and to, if I have the kind of access to you that allows me to help you shift so that virtuous cycles of mutual help become the nature of our ways of interaction so that the vicious cycles, the races to the bottom that are on every side are actually able to be interrupted in active time. These are new kinds of relationships for us to have with one another. And so this conversation among practitioners in which we inquire into our richest possibilities, that's, I think, the place that your consideration will naturally take itself if you pursue it with rigor and integrity and, uh, and humility. So, so obviously the Rebel Wisdom, the channel, sort of originated from the interest in Jordan Peterson and the interest in the phenomenon of Jordan Peterson as much as the, the message of Jordan Peterson. Of course, the two things are deeply intertwined and I'm hugely impressed with his thinking as well. I wouldn't dismiss that. And then what I, what I sensed with him was there was a, a very, um, almost a theory of everything, a kind of integral theory of everything, which both of us are familiar with from Ken Wilber's work and interested in the sort of the dialogue between these two very, very singular and very interesting visions of trying to bring lots of different wisdom traditions together and lots of different historical traditions. Obviously, Jordan Peterson mainly focused on the mythopoetic, uh, the mythic tradition and the Christian tradition, and Ken probably a bit more interested in the Eastern traditions of of wisdom and, and Buddhism and bringing those together. And obviously, you've been in, you've been involved in the integral community for many years. I'd really love to get your take on on those two different visions, where they interact, maybe where they where you see the the shortcomings or where they don't where they don't coincide. But there's certainly a very interesting dialogue to be had between those two really amazing thinkers and amazing perspectives. Well, my uh, own background of spiritual practice is what I call uh, transcendental spirituality, non-dual spirituality, which is pretty much Ken's history as well. And this really has to do with waking up from false forms of separation, false divisions, waking up beyond the self and other, the story of separation, waking into the ineffable mystery, uh, many, many false divisions falling away and us arriving at the level of being in a full liberation of awareness and feeling and the intuition of ourselves is not separate from all things. And this is, I think, the the senior, you might, you might call it senior in a certain sense, because the highest realizations of the great mystical traditions are all arriving at that understanding. And that has a certain kind of practice or sadhana. And it's a universal sadhana. We all, whatever our particular form of expression, wake up to the same undifferentiated suchness and mystery and beingness and love and freedom and joy and all the rest. It's, it's a universal path. But we're also each unique individuals. And the uniqueness of each individual is also a mystical path. And that's more the mythopoetic path. It's soul work. And that soul work has to do with understanding our, well, it, actually not understanding so much. <laughs> it, it has to do with dropping to a deeper level of attention wherein the, a different kind of information becomes available. Some of the most important decisions that every human being makes in their lives are very particular to you. Which college do you go to? Do you marry that sweetheart or do you divorce at a certain point in a stuck relationship? Do you move to a certain town? Do you form this partnership or that? Those are very particular decisions and they do need to be informed by our deepest wisdom. And our deepest wisdom is not going to be found in the universal mystery. The universal mystery 
loves you and helps you be clearer and maybe you enter into that decision with a kind of spaciousness of attention that is of a different character, but it doesn't give you any particular data about which way to go. That really comes from, in the traditions, the, this transcendental form of things would be associated with the causal and non-dual. The mythopoetic relates to the subtle and the subtle or soul levels are where all kinds of very specific information can be available, where we can be guided by deeper, subtler knowings and that are much more embodied. And that subtle realm has a lot to do with shamanism, journeys, the mysticism of the natural world. Sometimes there are, you know, people have all kinds of ways of interacting, totem animals, spirit visitations, indigenous wisdom is key to this mythopoetic love the storytellers and th there's a whole world of beautiful and important spirituality there and it takes the soul and the journey in time as its foundations whereas the transcendental spiritual path wakes you up to the emptiness of self the emptiness of time you transcend all that to exclusively always try to transcend that ends up almost always with certain kinds of bypassing. To just be focused on the soul work and the mythopoetic path almost always ends up in a kind of uh, egoity because I, I can do that work and discover my purpose and have my fulfilling work and my soulmate and all kinds of things that are peculiar to my own path and, and that easily slip over into self-fulfilling and, 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 a, and an imagination that that self is ultimately real. You can do that deep soul work and if your soul realizes its purpose fully, these two paths become a single, you know, you might say an enchanted, uh, but, but, a, but in another way a very clear and open, available human being. And within that I think there's an, uh, a release of feeling of every kind of feeling. There's a, an opening of 360 degree feeling, an ability to feel all the things that in a way too, too horrible to feel. The, the degree of uh, contradiction that we are in. I am alive in a world in which my very lifestyle is part of what it is that is killing the future of everything I love. That's too horrible to feel. And there is so much suffering in the world, human and non-human. It's very hard to allow ourselves to really feelingly, in an embodied way, be actually related to that. We're almost all of us numbed out in relation to all that. And that has us there in our heads, and it has us figuring things out. And it has us having arrogant conversations that aren't really deeply feelingly related to what's really going on. On the other hand, the, uh, that embodied engagement easily slips into the inherent, uh, you might call it a centricity, the targeting mechanism of the self becomes the conceit through which everything is seen and therefore we're, we're essentially selfish. We'll never, through the mythopoetic path alone, we will never get beyond rivalrous dynamics. We actually have to be changed in a way that requires the transcendent spirituality. So we're being asked really for an enormous uh, leap of personal maturation and it has to express itself. It's, it's not only do I have to mature in all those ways, but I have to find other people who are close enough to the maturation I'm going through that I can engage with them in a way where we become a different kind of collective where friendship becomes something different, community and cooperation become something different, where genuinely non-rivalrous dynamics come into being that enable cooperation to outcompete competition because that is in a way the design spec of any kind of healthy social movement scaling in a time when that's absolutely critical. Because there's this there's a kind of paradox if we take Jordan Peterson as the kind of his the focus on the individual in Jordan Peterson. Like I, I see Jordan Peterson as 
necessary, maybe essential, but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. Like what he's bringing, this focus on the individual, this focus on being really clear about the impact of your words, being really self-critical about the way that your own, your own truth and, and orienting yourself by that is absolutely essential. And in some ways you can't bypass that to go to co cooperation or collaboration without, without continually coming back to that individual perspective. But it is, it is insufficient. And I see a lot of people who criticize Jordan Peterson for, for, for that focus on the individual and sort of almost characterizing him as a kind of Ayn Rand type figure that mm. any kind of collaboration, any kind of collective uh, action is, um, is undesired or, or wrong, right. for want of a better word. For me, that misses the point because we have to go through that that to be able, and in some sense, if we go through enough into our own our own self, we need to have gone through our own stuff to the point where we actually do recognize ourselves in the other. Mm. That there is this sense of we are, if you want to take a sort of deep Taoist or Buddhist perspective, we are the same being looking out through through other eyes. But the the thing that's preventing us from seeing that is our own personal history, our own personal stuff, our own personal conditioning, and our sense of separation that then leads us to those rivalrous dynamics of trying to get ahead at the cost of, a, of other people. So it's only through that, that deep inner work and focus on the individual that we can come to a genuine collective connection and collaboration that is not going to be undermined by all of that unresolved stuff. If that, I, I, I kind of agree. But what I would argue is everything is necessary to everything else. A holistic transformation is obliged upon us. The outer work can't wait. We can't wait in, in the United States. We can't wait to come together to some degree to defeat Trump, even with people who lack many of the essential understandings that are most important to us. We still have to find our way into different levels of communion with other people and authentic relating in, in, a, in a new way. We, we have to, and we have to do the personal work. I often will uh, abbreviate the nature of an integral practice as consisting of the inner work, the outer work, and the inter interpersonal work. And that outer work, in a way, has two dimensions, like the, the, you know, the four quadrants would imply, in that there's behavior change and then there's systems change, and both are crucial. So people who are experimenting with relocalization, who are uh, paying attention to the wisdom of indigenous people who are focused on the inescapability of our ecological origins. People in my book, I describe three groups, the ecologists, the innovators, and the evolutionaries, as each of them holding essential pieces of the human future and being in serious conversations about them. Well, if we don't do all that work at once, we're not getting where we want to go. So I agree with you. Jordan Peterson is pointing us to something really essential. But I think he's also pointing us away from something else that's also essential. It is absolutely true that we're not going to fulfill our collective actions in anything like the way we need to unless we ourselves are transformed. But it's also true that there are collective actions we have to take right away before we're transformed. So the emphasis of one essential piece of reality at the expense of another is endemic in so many of our conversations. So I think that the inquiry you're engaging at Rebel Wisdom will mature more and more as you are sifting out how to hold multiple essential truths that seem to be in tension with one another. And then holding them, the, act, the practice of holding them as individuals and in relation to one another. I think this is the, the leading edge of where your consideration is going to lead. Yeah, and I want to address one of those um, conflicting truths or perspectives, which is talked about, if we're going to use integral terminology, we can talk about green. Green as a, pers a, as a relativistic, postmodern perspective that obviously Jordan Peterson has a, a very a strong antipathy to and I think Ken in the interview that I did with him as well said that if he has shadow material it's also located in this antipathy to green and 
I wanted to, and I know that you're much more sympathetic toward to, to the green perspe perspective. Uh, and I wanted to kind of ask you to explore that a little bit. What do you think we're missing if we're throwing out? You, I, I guess you'd say that we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater if we reject green. Can you explain what that means? Like unpack what green is for people who maybe are okay. not so familiar with the term sure. and then say, then maybe talk about what, how, right. we, how we integrate it from your perspective. Well, you know, we went from thinking that the truth was in the Bible and what the king and the pope said in the traditional era to using the methods of science and observation and the magic of the free market in the modern time to beginning to recognize that whoever dies with the most toys wins only a soulless game and that uh, deep sensitivity to our interiors and to the hidden structures that can work to suppress and distort and hurt and oppress disadvantaged groups, people of color, women, LGBTQ people and so forth. This is the, the postmodern. But postmodern is the least mature of these broadly, uh, you know, there are large populations occupying primarily traditional or modern or postmodern values and those in the postmodern are the least fully developed. And you can have people of any level of personal cognitive complexity and ability adopting the values and ideas of any of these values. So the ones that are adopting postmodern values very often are doing so in a rather narrow way with belief uh, motivating them. And because... So adopting it as an ideology rather than as a value system perhaps might be a way of... Well, they're, they're perhaps they don't have necessarily the cognitive complexity or personal maturity to have arrived at this very nuanced you know, middle vision logic is the term for the kind of cognitive complexity required at the postmodern level. And very often people are adopting those values because they're kind of cool, you know, in the urban centers with very limited action logics. And so they approach it in a way that is full of uh, us them dynamics and, and, and limited views and you have uh, this increase in sensitivity and, and many people are really experiencing that increase in sensitivity and uh, the sensitive self comes online in this postmodern level. But that sensitivity can function destructively when we say oh well this hurts my feelings and we shouldn't let anybody have a talk here at my college that might offend my feelings and we begin to shut down dialogue and there's this mean green phenomenon and I, I find that utterly confounding and frustrating just like Jordan Peterson and Ken Wilber do. But the postmodern level of meaning making is also the one that first begins to grok ecosystems and the necessity of uh, living in harmony with a bigger reality and is less anthropocentric and actually able to humble itself before its foundations and, and understand the deep, deep truths of deep ecology. It, it, deep ecology may be held in a doctrinaire and problematic way by some people, but it is also holding deep truths. So in my view, mature integral expresses in what I call radical integral ecology in which the deep truths of deep ecology and the profound truths of integral are simultaneously held. And that means getting beyond our allergies to postmodernism so that these either or dynamics uh, are, are nuked. We, we always have to reject what we outgrow at first. And we are all in a moment in which there are environments in which really ugly, useless, postmodern rigidities get inflicted upon us, where men have no voice in the conversation around gender, where uh, anybody who admits to having some, uh, you know, every one of us have evolved through, through hundreds of years or hundreds of thousands of years in hunter-gatherer bands where who was in my clan and who was in the other clan was absolutely essential and implicit bias, racial bias exists everywhere and therefore everybody in that sense is a little bit racist and yet racism has become such a moral condemnation that the fact that any, anybody admits this is sort of taboo and, and, and 
So if you're white and male and my age, you're supposed to be the last to speak, or maybe you shouldn't speak at all. The complexities of what goes on, it's, it's, you know, it's garbage, it's a mess. On the other hand, the care, there is care in that critique. It, the, the care is being exercised in a clumsy and violent and destructive way, but there's still something cared about that matters. So postmodern values do not need to be discarded. They're absolutely essential to our maturation, and especially at a time when we're in an existential crisis, many of, the, of whose most significant uh, dimensions are ecological, that the postmodern worldview, which r is the basis for the broad appreciation for our ecological origins in nature, is you know to to be fighting with that is is that's the elephant in the room. So there's a problem I think in the intellectual dark web in integral circles at the leading edge of culture when we notice the limitations of postmodernism in such a way that we lose touch with our own moral obligation to be champions of a new reunification that especially includes we're going to have to repattern our lives in a way that is actually sustainable on this planet Earth. And that is such an enormous transition, that repatterning of our lives, that a deep sacred appreciation for the Earth, for what is most basic, for what is most fundamental, is essential to our sanity. And if our conversation can't become stronger in that dimension, we're lost. I think both you and I, from our background and history, have some sense that it's not just an intellectual... Let me start again. I think we both have some sense, from our kind of background and history, that a lot of the, the people addressing these issues at the moment are coming from a very intellectual level. And there's a sense of the systems thinkers, and there's, there's, a, there's an abandonment, or there's not an understanding of the, the more embodied nature of the transformation that we need to go through and I think more and more people are kind of sensing that but I think key to that has to be some kind of techniques or practice or um, yeah so, some some way of 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 interacting with our own inner states and maybe processing and maybe what, what's your attitude to practice and how important do you think that is for 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 the transition that we're looking at practice is at the center of my dharma, because uh, in a sense, practice is living intentionally. It's in intentionally cultivating what is best in ourselves, or we can practice together. Practice isn't only individual, it can be collective. Can you give some examples of practice, just so we can kind of ground that? Well, sure. Uh, practices include meditation, conscious exercise, yoga, qigong, psychotherapy, medicine journeys. Uh, they also, in, it also includes uh, uh, just physical strengthening, uh, gym, uh, anything that we do, uh, any re repeated activity that changes us and that cultivates new qualities, we can, we can call a practice. And if, as we really deepen into an integral, a full understanding of what practice is, we realize that just putting your time in on the cushion is not enough that you have to cultivate a body-mind that is capable of conducting more energy and consciousness, that, it, that it's a whole being, multidimensional matter, and that every moment of life involves choices where we fall unconsciously into patterns by tendency and where we can make different and better choices, so that really all of life is practice if it's rightly understood. And in a moment in which we are all shaped to a very strong momentum of human culture that's growth-based and competition-based and those patterns are tending to become self-terminating, we're asked to go through a collective transformation and that transformation ideally would involve us bringing our intentions together in a whole different way. So collective practice is also obligatory. And the conversation among practitioners might go something like uh, 
gosh, I'm feeling really great because my consciousness is opening up in this way and this and that has changed in some of my relationships and man, I feel like I'm in a whole new level of my life right now. And my friend might respond, yeah, but you know, you're a little inflated in a certain way and that enthusiasm almost bowls me over. I'm not sure there's room for you to really hear and feel me and take me in. You seem so full of your own new insight and I might then learn from that and shift and take that person into account in a better way. Or in another moment, I might share the place where I feel like I'm up against something and my good practitioner friend might share, not just, you know, we tend to tell our own stories to one another. Very, very often, we don't engage real conversations. We're in a moment now, culturally, where we actually have to hear, listen, take in one another care enough to actually engage that other. And most human conversations are not even close to that level currently. So we're cultivating a, a different kind of fellowship and friendship as well. So the conversation among practitioners might also then be one in which we really seek to get each other. This is something like circling an authentic uh, communication, but Circling and authentic communication rarely take as their prompt our collective evolutionary imperative, the fact that everything has to change. We're mostly preoccupied with healing and succeeding within the existing system, not acknowledging that it too has to change. So the profundity of the challenge that we're all living under tends not to be surfaced in a way that brings us together in a richer way. And I think those are frontiers that are, the frontier of practice is an integration of the inner work, the inner work, the outer work, behavior change, systems change, becoming effective change agents through social entrepreneurship and sometimes protest, and a whole variety of things. Everybody's holding a piece of the truth. Very often, they're inflicting limitations on others and they're arrogant, but with enough epistemic humility, we can include others and we're gonna to have to because there's no way through this. In, in, in this country, in the United States, I need the Trump voters. I'm not gonna succeed. If, even if I get all the folks who wanna help me vote out Trump, which I'd love to do, that those, that, isn't enough. We're not going forward as a society unless we find our commonality at a broader level. And so a kind of compassion and respect for people who are getting a lot of things wrong is essential to our life of practice. So practice is in a moment where it itself must evolve. Our very best versions of practice are a beginning point, not an end point. So the, the, the profundity of the sacred that which you actually bow down before. This is holy, this is greater than me. And, and we can respond both to the ineffable mystery of existence with that kind of heartfelt gratitude and submission, and we can also respond to the living earth that way. Those are different kinds of sanctity. One of them is theoretically at the top of the evolutionary sequence and one is the foundation. But this universal appreciation of the sacred as both the ground and the destiny of our life of practice creates a, 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 a context in which the heart can respond. The intelligent uh, one with the executive function who's steering the ship has better information to work with on the basis of all this. But we're not gonna get there if the only people who can do what's necessary are the ones with massive levels of intellectual sophistication. Part of what we're looking for is the simplicity on the other side of that complexity, which is a different way of being human, that we can live in common with many different kinds of human beings. And when we're seeing the essential sacred divine nature, you might say, of every human soul, even as we're looking through the illusion of selfhood and discovering another way of being human altogether that none of us can see yet. 
I just want to pick up on the the point you made about Trump, um, because my sense is that Trump won't be voted out, or the we won't see a shift there until the lessons of Trump are learned. And I, for me, the lessons of Trump are that the liberal classes created this in some the shadow of the liberal classes created this in some way with this sense of a tribalism that didn't want to admit that it was a tribalism we're so liberal we're so inclusive apart from the deplorables and that trump was a reaction to that and i don't see i and when we're talking about practice and we're talking about kind of seeing um a deeper connectedness that's the the issue that i see as the big problem is this is until we learn the lessons of Trump, and I don't see real, really any signs of that amongst the sort of certainly the Democrats, certainly the sort of the, the wider liberal classes. Do you would you agree with that diagnosis? Partially, I, I do think that there is. So let me tell you where I don't disagree first. Where I disagree first, uh, there's a great deal of corruption right now in the Republican Party. And there are, there are, we are under pressure, we are under stress, and under stress, dysfunction comes forward. And there's a fair amount of psychopathy in every society, and that psychopathy has concentrated and become pretty, you know, very significant majority of it is concentrated on the right in supporting the Republican Party. And so there is something that simply has to be resisted. So I'm sympathetic with aspects of the left side of the polarization. There, is, there are two things I absolutely am against, psychopathy and cynicism. My politics are anti-psychopathic and anti-cynical. Uh, and there's at, plenty of that on, in aspects of the left as well. There, there, are, there are all kinds of dysfunctions operative on the left. But what I see in maybe a typical Democratic candidate like Cory Booker is something a heck of a lot more healthy. So I'm, I'm not alarmed by Cory Booker in anything like the way I'm alarmed by what I see in Donald Trump. And therefore, I do think that there is a, a little bit of a, a good guy, bad guy dynamic at work there. And I'm happy to be with the Democrats in that particular polar, polarity because I think it's important. However, I think that the uh, demonization of racism and the, uh, the superiority that uh, successful coastal elites feel to the Trump voters in flyover country are definitely a big part of what has created the Trump phenomenon. And I, and I agree with you that there's not nearly enough self-awareness about those limitations. I think a different level of compassion and respect is necessary. But very often, you know, the people who are trying to convene transpartisan conversations find that it's a lot easier to get people on the left who want to have those conversations than people on the right. And that's, that's a sign of something. And, and it doesn't speak well to what's on the right. So in my view of things, there, there kind of ought to be, and I hope there will be, a powerful repudiation of Trump in the next election. And I think that will open an opportunity because the people who come together to try to oppose him will have some commonality out of which some of these healthier expressions and some of the important critiques of the excesses of postmodernism can be surfaced and maybe we can, you know, we have some opportunities to coalesce aspects of the international intergenerational movement that hu the human predicament requires. On the other hand, the, there, there is, there's also a, uh, there's an availability among people who are involved in their attention to their sensitivities if they're spoken to in terms of what they can feel. So although there are plenty of whatever, I don't know, Muslim women of color who are lesbians, I don't know, somebody in the most disadvantaged group who ought to speak first in the left-wing 
meeting that, you know, all, only marginalized voices ought to be heard first. Uh, very often that person might be so full of self-righteousness and thinking they know what's what and they just want to talk and not listen. But caught in the right moment and in the right context, there's also a sensitivity to their own lived and felt experience and therefore a curiosity about the lived and felt experience of people they haven't closed their hearts to. And if that can be extended all the way eventually to white men, that we have a kind of access to them. And I think we also have access to the Trump voters. It's just that it takes tremendous maturity and a kind of unconditional loving appreciation that we are not really ultimately separate to look at somebody in that way and feel them and speak to their what's best in them, trusting that that will eventually find its way to surface is really skillful communication. And it won't work with somebody who's fundamentally committed to a psychopathic or cynical orientation. And there are people on both left and right that we're not going to be able to reach. But I think that this sense that our heartfelt com communications that draw us into our commonality and wake us up to the fact that we're in the same troubled lifeboat together, that is our opportunity right now. And there are that's going to make a lot possible that's never been possible before. Hmm. I, I guess I'd agree with a lot of what you said. The bit that didn't scan for me, and I know won't scan for a lot of people, is saying that people on the left are more open to conversation than people on the right. I think there's a certainly, um, I mean, it's something Eric Weinstein talks about a lot, Brett Weinstein talks about a lot, that actually they found much more openness to have discussions, especially about hot topics on on among the center right than they do among the left because those conversations are often shut down with accusations of bigotry or whatever. Um, and that feels true to me. Like there's certain things that can be discussed in the media and in academia, I think, that, that, are, that, are, that, that the force of censorship, I do feel is coming more from the left than from the right. So I, I wonder whether... Actually, I, I agree with you. I think I was talking more about my own experience with individuals uh, the, there are environments, particularly the academies and certain activist circles in the urban centers where the left is very closed and, and, and just suppressive. That's why it's been from the left that we've seen so many attacks on free speech. But that doesn't, not, nonetheless, we, I, I think, have an opportunity to scale the beginnings of the kind of movement we want to see in many areas of culture, which are, you know, some of the very important ones are on the center right, but I'd say the larger population is more toward the left, although there are elements of the left that are going to fight it tooth and nail. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. That's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.